So music memory is about how we remember um, musical elements that could be songs or melodies or rhythms and whether there are any rules to this. So um, whether we remember all songs equally well or whether there are some songs that are easier to remember than others and uh, also about how we remember them, what strategies we have, how that's related to musical training for example and whether there are differences between people in their ability to remember um, musical material. It's important from a perspective in, uh, from general psychology because uh, if we study musical memory we study how the mind deals with non-verbal auditory information and music is a great domain for that because we can't attach meaning easily to uh, melodic elements or, or rhythms. They, they are what they are. They, you can't easily recode them in, in verbal terms, for example, or associate uh, visual memories with that. Um, so it's a really good domain to study uh, the human mind and memory in, in general. Uh, and from a musical perspective, it's interesting to understand for music teachers and musical learners uh, how we approach learning music and what, is there a good strategy to uh, learn a new song, commit that to memory, play from memory at a performance. How should we do that and uh, why are certain structures easier to learn than, than others? So that's the general idea of what this topic is about. Uh, I think the study of um, musical memory if we leave out the really early history. It started maybe in the 1960s and 70s when people started uh, with, um, uh, within the cognitive paradigm within psychology uh, to run auditory memory experiments. And then in addition to verbal materials, uh, some auditory psychologists started using individual tones for example, Diana Deutsch was an important researcher who, who started researching in the late 60s um, memory for individual tones or short uh, tone sequences. And uh, most of the musical stimuli were melodies or short melodies of some sort, but they were specially constructed, so they sounded very artificial. Those m might have been sine tones generated from sine tone uh, generator, with no rhythm and uh, very boring music, really psychological experimental music that you wouldn't choose to listen to. Um, but the great advantage of having these uh, stimuli as uh, vehicles was that uh, you could manipulate them and you would have full control over what people have to study in these experiments and that then gives you uh, an angle to compare different conditions between simple and complex melodies, melodies that have different types of contours or different patterns of, of ups and downs, whether adding rhythm would help or would make memory worse, for example, uh, whether there are interference effects between, uh, if you have to remember one tone here and compare it to a tone there, does it matter what series of tones are in the middle, for example. So uh, there were dozens of experiments run and um, studies published on musical memory of these very simple musical stimuli that ordinary musicians wouldn't even consider uh, music uh, at all. But for a psychologist it is still a different thing to uh, remember speech, for example. And uh, yeah, later in the, in the 80s and 90s uh, people started using um, more natural uh, musical materials, so uh, real melodies taken from songs uh, or from classical music, uh, rhythms as they would occur in, uh, in uh, real music, and also started to compare uh, music from different cultures. So uh, does it make a difference whether I, as a Western listener, need to remember uh, an African song or a Finnish song, for example? Are they uh, easily equal for me or how much does the experience with a particular musical culture help uh, to remember that particular material. Um, so this got increasingly uh, complex and there was more input from musicians and uh, musical practitioners in this line of research as well because the, the pressing questions were not about uh, artificial uh, 
a short sine tone series, but more about uh, real melodies. And uh, so one of the results uh, that has been replicated a lot of time is that musical contour is something that um, uh, is really important in remembering novel stimuli. So the pattern of ups and downs in, uh, in pitch. And that's something that we extract uh, very easily and readily from new melodies that we don't know in advance. In addition, we seem to uh, abstract tonal information. So which key does a melodic series uh, belong to? And then if we have these two types of information, contour and tonality, uh, we are able to reconstruct uh, a melody fairly faithfully if we pay close attention. Um, and that's a theory that uh, Jay Dowling published in 1978, the uh, theory of um, uh, contour and tonality for musical memory, that these would be the two primary constituents, how we re remember melodies. Um, obviously, if you look at more complex music, so um, a full song or a full symphony, it, uh, there's also the question where the attention goes. So what elements we focus on, whether we have a, an analytical ear uh, and, and really focus on individual musical elements, or whether we are uh, just in a mode of listening where we rather extract um, emotions, uh, gestures, musical uh, kind of in intentional meaning that the performer put into the music. And that might then limit our capacity to process uh, individual elements very faithfully. But in a real world musical listening process, it's, it's uh, often not um, important to ha commit everything that we listen to to memory. The important thing anyway is to remember that um, uh, most of these processes work unconsciously. So even if you're not a musician, but you're a normal music listener, uh, you will be able to remember melodies and compare one melody that you heard a minute ago to another one that you hear sometime later. So there's a lot of implicit knowledge that is important in, in music and that's a uh, very interesting domain. So you can learn music or understand music and remember music and process music just by being exposed to music and the musical culture. And that's different from very, um, many other domains where you need to be taught ex explicitly, for example, what the, uh, the meaning of individual elements are. That's not the case with music. And that distinguishes music from, say, learning a, a, another language, for example, which you just couldn't do by listening to the radio in an unknown uh, language. Uh, and I think these days, uh, research has evolved to um, look at more and more um, uh, ecologically valid stimuli, so more music as it occurs in the real world. And uh, one of the lines of research that we've been conducting here at Goldsmith over recent years is uh, to take um, melodies from a large corpus of popular melodies, so pop mel melodies, Western commercial pop music, as it was released from the 1950s to today, and try to uh, identify features in these melodies to see whether there's anything in the melodies that makes them more or less memorable. Um, so we are not manipulating the melodies, but we're taking them as they have been published and then try to find um, uh, associations between these features. Uh, those features could be complexity or the range of the intervals, uh, the distribution of duration values, uh, anything. Uh, to see whether these features are associated with uh, how we or how listeners process them cognitively and then try to explain why some melodies are easier remembered than others. And that, uh, this line of research has been successful to uh, degrees. So we did find a set of features that in combination are responsible for um, uh, a, a better memory or better memorability. But there's still a lot of uh, unexplained uh, variance in the data. So there's a lot that we don't know, uh, where we don't know why some melodies are remembered better than others. Uh, a lot might have to do with um, an interaction between people, their personal listening history and the stimulus. So for example, if you've never been 
exposed to blues music and for the first time you hear a blues melody, um, then this new structure that you're presented with might not fall into your templates, your learned templates, and therefore you might uh, find this more difficult to remember than others, uh, than other melodies. Uh, and this interaction between individuals, uh, listeners, and stimuli is something that uh, I think is worth exploring and that many people try to get uh, at at the moment. Um, one thing that's also um, helping uh, right now is that there are computational tools from music information retrieval and from other areas that uh, help us to describe these uh, or melodies or music in general in computational terms. So we have very um, clear and precise definitions of musical features that uh, could be relevant for human cognition. Um, and that also gives the possibility to search large corpora of uh, music and, and melodies for these features. And that again then helps in psychological research to select stimuli uh, that have uh, much of a certain feature or very little of a certain feature. And then we can compare these two uh, sets of stimuli and see how people deal with that and see whether this feature makes a particular difference. So I think, in summary, computational tools, uh, larger corpora of uh, melodies and larger samples of participants and more varied samples of participants regarding their expertise uh, are the three factors that are driving this field at the moment and uh, that could deliver exciting results and might bring us closer to the question um, uh, to understand how we remember musical memory, uh, how we re remember musical melodies.